Hi guys, we're the Robinson Twins. I'm Rick. And I'm Bob. And today we're going to talk about the curvature of the Earth and people who have witnessed it. Our dad had a career with the U.S. Air Force, and so we grew up on or near military bases. And the only foreign assignment we had was to Kadena Air Force Base, Okinawa. And it's there that we found a love for our most favorite aircraft, the SR-71. Officially, the SR-71 is called the Blackbird, but when we were on Okinawa, we knew it as the Habu because that was the name of a venomous snake on the island, and the Okinawans thought this long, thin airplane reminded them of that snake. We saw the SR-71 Blackbird take off and land at the Kadena Air Force Base runway many times, and in fact, uh, once it circled right over the, the house where we were living. It was low enough that we could actually see the windows on the bottom of the fuselage where the cameras and other sensors were set up. We were uh, living on Kadena Air Force Base in the early 1970s, and here are some slides from that time of the SR-71 taxiing out to the runway to take off. We took these pictures while we're on Okinawa, so we've witnessed the plane taking off and landing and circling the runway. And we got these pictures, uh, interestingly enough, from the golf course that had a nice view of the flight line. The SR-71 was a reconnaissance aircraft that was very futuristic looking. It could do Mach 3.2 on a regular basis, 3.2 times the speed of sound, and could routinely cruise at altitudes over 80,000 feet. The SR-71 program was ultimately canceled in 1998 and since then, a number of the pilots of SR-71s have uh, written books or are covering the lecture circuit talking about their experiences. And they routinely say two things that are applicable to the flat Earth versus globe Earth debate. Number one, from their flights, they could see the curvature of the Earth. And number two, they could see the darkness of space above them, even while what was below was in daylight because at their altitudes, the vast majority of the atmosphere is well below them and they could see the blue sky, but they could also see stars above them. So on a website called The Adrenaline Zone, in an article entitled The View at Mach 3, Lieutenant Colonel Ed Yielding, an SR-71 pilot, reported this. We were cruising near 85,000 feet and it was our max altitude and we always tried to operate with the best altitude for the weight of the airplane for fuel economy. So normally we didn't get all the way to 85,000 feet, but somewhere in the 80,000 range. And so at that altitude, we're above 97% of the air molecules. And so you had a really nice view of the earth. You can see the curvature of the earth and more noticeable than the curvature was how dark it was overhead wasn't as black as what Sandra saw, who was an astronaut in this uh, conversation, in this interview, but it was very dark blue, almost black. So that was even more noticeable than the curvature of the Earth. Later on in that same interview, and this is very interesting about the SR-71, Lieutenant Colonel Ed Yielding says, so we had a star tracker there was a little telescope mounted behind the navigator and that little telescope would fly around and find stars. And so for that to work, the back seater, the reconnaissance systems officer, had to dial in what day of the year you're flying and they would plug in a very accurate clock into the airplane. So the airplane knew exactly where the earth was in its rotation as well as its revolution. So it knew where to look for the stars, and it would look in the direction of a star and then do a search until it found the star, measure that angle, and keep our position updated. So that is how the SR-71 accomplished navigation by stars. SR-71 is a combination of power and majesty. When you look at it, it just has a mystique that I think is going to live for generations and generations. I wish I could take everybody up to 85,000 feet because you can see 350 miles in any direction. You see the curvature of the Earth. In the cockpit, the small triangular windows there are about 620 degrees. My side windows are about 580. And it's about 
an inch and a half quartz glass, much like your oven glass at home. And that's what was protect the, uh, protect the crew members. The navigator's windows were more in the range of about 480 degrees, but they're hot. You can't hold your hand against the window for more than five or 10 seconds at most, even in your spacesuit before it's just too hot to touch. So the windows of the SR-71 were made of one and a half inch thick quartz glass that would not distort the pilot's view out the window. And one more SR-71 pilot, Daryl Greenmeyer, says, The majority of the flights were like flying a kitty car. It's a slick flying, easy flying airplane. You're just sitting up looking down at the contrails that the airlines are making and the curvature of the Earth. And it's an exciting adventure. Wide-angle lenses are used for filming the pilot and guest inside the plane, but their view out of the window is not distorted by the window. They do see Earth's curvature. Right now, I'm flying in a U-2 spy plane. 70,000 feet high at the edge of space. If you look outside, you can actually see the curvature of the Earth. So to all the flat earthers out there, I hate to burst your bubble, but take a look at that. Now crossing 50,000 feet is a bit of a milestone. This is the altitude where Earth's atmosphere ends and the stratosphere begins. And historically, was once considered space, or at least what's known as the space equivalent zone. Well, Sam, there goes 50. Your old altitude is now old. It's all new territory from here. And you can see she still wants to climb. At altitudes above 50,000 feet, a person will become quickly hypoxic. Why? Simply put, there's not enough air pressure to allow your lungs to absorb the limited amount of oxygen that's in the atmosphere. So if you're going to be flying at these altitudes, you need to be wearing a full pressure suit. Hence why we call it the space equivalent zone. So if you notice here, if you kind of look slightly above the horizon, you can see a gradation of blue into a dark blue. Yeah. If you could look directly above you, it would go even darker. So as we continue to climb here, if you kind of, maybe out the right side versus towards the sun there. And you can start to make out the gentle, gentle curve. As the numbers on the altimeter continued to climb higher and higher, and as we quickly approached the 70,000 foot milestone, the views to my left and right were something straight out of a sci-fi movie. Other than the astronauts in the International Space Station, the two of us sitting in this aircraft are the highest human beings in the world. And as my pilot Mongo reminded me, because the rear cockpit in the two-seat version of the U-2 sits a few feet higher than the pilot in the front, that meant I was actually the highest human on Earth. You really are on top of the world here. Well, you more than me right now. Up until this point, for my entire life, every time I've ever looked up during the day, I've seen blue sky or clouds. But at this point, it's 70,000 feet. For the very first time, the atmosphere is now below us. So when you look up, you see the dark black vastness of space. Yeah, I feel like I uh, know the answer to this question, but does the view ever get old? I don't think it ever will. A few years ago, on October 23rd, I had the rare opportunity to soar to the edge of space in a U-2 reconnaissance aircraft. I had intensified my training for two months, lost a required 29 pounds, checked onto the base for systems orientation, and I was fitted into my 130-pound spacesuit, climbed aboard the aircraft with my commander, and we took off and immediately climbed, rapidly climbed, to 17 miles above the Earth's surface, where for five hours I sat in the sounds of silence, 
looking at the breathtaking curvature of the earth, gazing into the endless blackness of the universe, pondering eternity and my place in it. And with an unobstructed view of our planet, I teared up as an eyewitness to the words of Einstein that the mind once stretched can never return to its original dimensions. And each direction. And each direction. Yeah. So you almost 500 miles of view in one flight. Yes. Yeah. Not much traffic up here. No, it's super quiet. A lot of times when we get up to altitude, you'll be able to look down and see the airliners. It's peaceful up here, isn't it? Yeah, fantastic. The people in the International Space Station were higher. But on Earth, there's nobody above 70,000. No plane can fly this high. No mountain reaches this high. And from here, I can see an amazing view of the entire area around San Francisco below me. You're just struck with how peaceful everything looks up there. Like all the stuff that man is doing down, down low, it gets muted when you're up there. And you just see the majesty that is the planet Earth. Uh, and, you, and, and then the, as you keep going higher and higher, you, you start seeing the curve and the black sky above you. Uh, it's, it's amazing. Other than the, the folks on the International Space Station, you're the highest human being on the planet at that given time, wow. and that's that's pretty special. Does that feeling ever change? Does that feeling ever less? No, no, no. That that that's always awesome. Um, it was the only time I thought the entire time on the flight I was going to be an emotional wreck when I saw the curvature of the Earth. Um, but truly, when I saw it, I just kind of looked at it, recognized it, and picked the camera back up. Mm -hmm. um, the time when I lost it in the plane was recording videos for my kid, my wife, and my and my dad. Um, so I just put the visor down. All right, Blair, here we go. Sounds good. Brown, good morning, Dragon 9-2. I have RDP already copy. Request a tactical departure. Dragon 9-1, blow well, ground your afternoon, sir. And just start approved. Clear to BOF via FCMD. Good view of the coast there. It's so cool. Hey Utah, um, I just lost the uh, the main camera real fast. I uh, let me. It, it's still running. Um, I'm going to switch over and shoot it manual, man. We got this. Don't worry. It's all good. I see him. That's sweet. Let's uh, let's try and see if we can bring him in slowly. Um, I'm going to set up for that, and then as we move in, I'll let you know when I'm going to get on the shutter. We can't get vertically much more closer to him. The, the turbulence. A little lower. So sick. Got a good stack for you. Very sweet. A little bit more. A little bit more. Holy sh. Hey man, if we can bring the plane back about 35 feet, I'd be grateful. Got some extra speed, I'm gonna pass over you and get on the right side. We got it. Just let me know when you're good, and then uh, we'll talk about clearing him off and we'll go high. Perfect. Higher, I mean. Oh dude, all the training and I am already wiped out. Only two more hours to go, man, right? 
getting a little darker above us. Hey, Dad. Um, I, uh, I didn't tell you, but I took your lens and um, I brought it to space. And I just want to say thank you for your support. You and Mom have been everything to me, and, and it's because of you that we've done this. Welcome to the club. Thank you for taking me. Anytime. It's as if like the horizon has just given way to the blackness above and bent. I I've never experienced anything like this. I I, I don't think I ever will again, man. This is amazing. smooth. It feels like a glider. At 70,000 feet, we are twice as high as any airliner I have ever flown in. There is a vastness out there that I can feel to the depths of my being, but that I cannot describe in words. I fully understand why some astronauts have felt compelled to become writers and painters. At some point, even the prominent geographic features on Earth, like mountains and large lakes, become so small you almost feel like you are leaving them behind. When you travel to the outer edge of everything you have ever known, a sense of isolation starts to set in. I thought of the expression, Mother Earth, we use so glibly, and it suddenly seemed deeply profound. This is an image we took from one of the YouTube videos. You can see we put a white line on along the front straight edge of the wing. So that means if it's, this was a fisheye lens, you'd see distortion as it goes from the center to the lower right. But it's not distorted, it's straight. So that means the curvature of the Earth that you see is real. Thanks for watching. Now be sure to like and subscribe.